Uh, I'm Elizabeth Pitts. Um, I'm currently an assistant professor of English at the University of Pittsburgh. I'm now Professor Pitts at Pitt in Pittsburgh. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm just, I'm embracing it because that's the only thing you can do at that point. <laughs> Um, <laughs> um, I'm, I'm brand new and um, actually as part of my hiring process, um, not only the search committee chair, but several members of my department, my new colleagues, um, as I started my new job, pulled me aside to say, we hired you because far more than any other candidate that we considered, you had actually collaborated with scientists. And um, that's what Pitt is trying to do. They're behind NC State, but they're following a very similar model. Um, it's a research intensive university. Um, it has a gigantic regional um, medical school and medical center affiliated with it that's the major employer in the city. Um, and they want, in the English department, to be able to collaborate and play with people in technical disciplines, and that's why I got hired. Um, so thank you, Igert, and thank you, uh, NSF. Um, working again on, oops. Um, I want to uh, pick up on uh, Pamela's discussion from this morning about integrating the humanities and the sciences. Um, I agree that it, we're all branches from the same tree, but sometimes for me the metaphor is maybe the, uh, the blind man and the elephant, right? And, and this issue of vocabulary has come, has come up a lot, and it can be really, really difficult when you get people, even people who are excited to be working with, with others who have different kinds of expertise. Um, and, and so I'm interested, you know, why would you even want to include a student whose doctoral de title, de degree is uh, communication, rhetoric, and digital media in this kind of collaboration? Um, there's been a couple of mentions of having people uh, do workshops, like how do you communicate about technical subjects, right, or media training? And, and I'm definitely someone who could provide that kind of expertise, but I, I'm here to argue that actually we can do a lot more. Um, again, I'm in the English department. Um, <laughs> we in the English department are the vocabulary people, right? If you may remember even back to K-12. Um, we are the language people. We are translators. And I would argue that, that um, English faculty and those in the humanities and the arts, we build bridges as, as part of our expertise. And this can be really valuable in terms of how, um, how to bring lots of different people together, right? If, if you want to successfully navigate different vocabularies, bring in the vocabulary people. Um, one of the main objects of study um, for me and my colleagues, right, is, is how do you even frame the problem in the first place? So. Um, I would argue that, you know, as we've seen this morning, right, when you do interdisciplinary work, we're bringing together these teams often because we have a big, hairy, audacious goal that we want to we want to achieve, right? There's a major problem that we want to solve. Um, what the humanities, I think, add to that discussion, um, and I would I would include critical social scientists. Like, I mean, and I'm talking, I'm basing this example on a lot of faculty in this room who taught me how to do this. Um, what we can add is figuring out how to frame the problem in the first place. Because that part is so easy to gloss over, but then when you try and put a technology in action or even just take action in the world, you suddenly encounter that your idea of what the problem is may not um, intersect all that well with the way that other people think about problems, and you, you're going to run into conflict real fast. right? So taking that really early first step of what is the problem we're trying to solve here and why, and how does a problem become a problem in the first place? Um, <clears throat> so um, what does that mean in practice? I'm going to give you a few examples. The first is um, Megan mentioned our cohort built a website. Um, as part of that, we that was an early project we did together. We had a lot of conversations trying to figure out what was the problem we, we wanted to solve. We didn't all agree. And a critical first step, right, as a, as a communication scholar, 
was we decided rather than rather than forge agreement we would just expand the scope of conversation. So this website that we, you know, there's a great question there. Th these are different pages off of it. How does this gene work, right? But then we went from there to, how do we think about patenting these mice, right? Um, to uh, what do we mean by invasive species in the first place? Um, to all the way to the human-mouse relationship. And each of these layers that we added on to the problem they begin to intersect with each other, and they become more and more important to our work over time. Um, but again, uh, part of what we're doing there is beginning to see how these technical questions overlap with regulatory questions, with ethical questions, with social questions, right? So um, beginning to find a common vocabulary, in part by trying to, you know, expand so that we're all beginning to have similar uh, conversations, right? So not narrow it blow it out, right, have a bigger conversation. Um, this is another project, right, that Megan and Carol and I did. Um, so um, first, let me start here. This, this website, when, when we started working on it in 2013, was a real pie in the sky issue. Anybody, including the biologists who are building these genetically engineered mice, would have told you at the time, we can't envision that anyone would actually release an entire population of genetically engineered mice onto an island anywhere in the near future. Part of the reason that these people wanted to have a conversation about what is this problem in the first place and how should we relate to it is because even the people building the mice had a little bit of ambivalence about this idea, right? This, I mean, if you work with mice in particular, you know these things are hard to control. <laughs> and, if, and they breed like crazy. And you're gonna just throw a bunch of them on an island and like, whoa, that's no small thing. You know, um, you go to, to a lot of restaurants these days, including here in the Research Triangle, and there's this like, you know, emblazoned with pride on the menu is no GMOs. And they're talking about vegetables. This is rodents, populations of rodents, um, mammals being released. Um, we expanded the conversation in part because we didn't want to jump right into being marketers, right? They didn't need media training. They needed to think about what are we doing in the first place and how do we feel about it? Which leads to this, right? Um, uh, Mice as agents, right? It, this term agency means the ability to, to influence your surroundings. And um, the question is, do the mice have any agency? In other words, will the mice always behave in the way that humans intend them to behave? And will they behave the same way over and over and over again? These are really important questions to be included in your mathematical models, as well as you know, building any kind of policy to regulate these kinds of creatures. And over time, we also found that um, the conversations were relevant even to the way that you do biology, right? So um, there's a lot of pressure on the sciences these days to, to think about standards, right? And the way that actually you get the, the foundation of, of being able to patent a genetically engineered organism in the first place assumes that it's always going to be the same thing. You have a product, right? Like that's how you can patent it. It's this, this is the one that, you know, you, you buy it according to these specifications. Um, my biologist friends kind of snicker at this, right, because they spend a lot of time around mammals who do not repeat the same, behave the same way over and over again, even at the level of their DNA, right? So there's this tension between standardization and, and biological and genetic variation. Um, and it, it frames how we think about mice and how they would influence, how they would or would not behave on islands, but it also even gets to the point of biomedical research. So I, a, a communication and rhetoric scholar, went with two biologist colleagues to present a paper we wrote with John III at a policy conference and said, hey, you know, the way you're regulating all of this is based on some, some, some assumptions that may have some weaknesses and we talked about what those are. Um, practically, when you think about standardized versus um, vari variation in, in, in mouse models and bio in, in research, it affects things like dosages. 
right? Um, things about, uh, like, we use mice as models to test all of our different medicines. To infer, to extrapolate from a mouse into a human is a big step. The other thing is if you standardize doses, sometimes in certain circumstances, as Caroline has taught me, um, the treatments you develop based on a body of a man uh, maybe aren't as effective in the body of a woman, right? So standardization versus vari variation. Um, it sounds like, you know, when you talk about something like agency, it's sort of this broad pie in the sky humanities question, but again, it's coming down to really practical implications. Um, the third example is this course that Megan and I developed and co-taught. Um, the typical division of labor in a course like this would be for Megan to speak purely to the technical issues and me to sort of be like, like the conscience or the ethics police, you know, like tisk tisk or something like that. Now I'm going to tell you all to behave. What we were able to do as a result of Igert was explode that model. And we both spoke from both the technical and the social, political, ethical issues. That means that undergraduates here at NC State had a model in Megan of a scientist who defines science as speaking about other people and conflict and ethics and how do we think about behaving responsibly. And they also had a model in me of somebody in the humanities who could speak with a fair amount of specificity about DNA and how it works. Um, this is one example of the type of work that our students do will do. I won't read it to you, but I think these are pretty sophisticated questions for an undergraduate to be asking. Um, other examples we had were um, a young honors student engineer developed a game that he took down to the Museum of Life and Sciences on a Saturday afternoon and invited people to play to think about um, the ethics of releasing mosquitoes in Florida. Um, really exciting work that would not have been possible without this kind of collaboration. Um, so I think that this comes down to the question of what kind of scientist do you want to train? Um, I think it can be all too easy if you're focusing on a narrow disciplinary perspective um, to, to, to encourage silver bullet thinking, right? Like, I'm creating this amazing innovation and the problem is that the world doesn't understand how great it is. That's pretty 1.0 thinking. Igert gets you past that. Um, I think that having bridge builders and people who think about narrative and story embedded in the kind of work can produce pretty exciting results. Um, and, and also it can enable, it can offer people in technical fields frameworks and support to think through ambivalences in their own work, right? I mean, if, if you have students in a lab going like, I don't know how I feel about this thing that I'm developing, and it involves releasing large populations of genetically engineered mammals into a wild space, I think you want to train those people to think through those feelings. I think you want to offer them support to do that. I don't think you want to create an environment in which they think that that's work that you outsource to the ethics police, right? Um, Igert's showing us how to do that. Um, I could talk about it a ton more. Um, what I'm doing now is writing a book that compares uh, the composition of genetically engineered organisms to the kinds of composition that we do in, when we write, right? Um, I'm also working on this art exhibit that Fred or and that Zach mentioned at the beginning. There's flyers on your table. Happy to talk more about it. Um, I'm going to stop there, but thank you all so much. It's been a pleasure.